Thank you. <clears throat> Yesterday we uh, reflected briefly on the element of this passage from 1 Peter 3, where the apostle tells us that we are to be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks of us about the hope that lies within us, but that we must do it with gentleness and respect. Today I want to focus on the words of Psalm 34 that are quoted in the text that was just read for us, where the psalmist says, and the apostle says, using the words of the psalmist, whoever would love life and see good deeds, good days, must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. Diane Eck is a professor at Harvard University and a a wonderful expert on world religions. She's frequently quoted in interfaith dialogues as saying something that I don't agree with and actually find it irritating when people keep quoting it. This is what it is. She says, if you know only one religion, you know no religion. Well, a rabbi friend of mine used that quotation in several public dialogues that he and I have had together with the Jewish and evangelical audiences. And so I finally decided to challenge him in a private conversation. And I said, I don't really think you, you, you believe that, what Diana X says, that if you only know one religion, you don't know any religion. I said, take your grandmother, for example. She lived in 19th century ghetto in Eastern Europe. She spent her life as a strictly observant Jew, attending synagogue faithfully, prayed fervently to God several times a day, right? And he said, yeah. And now take a Jewish sophomore at UCLA. Let's say he's 19 years old, he's fairly consistent in his observance, but not nearly as steeped in the tradition as your grandmother was. Unlike, though, he has an opportunity to take courses on Buddhism and Hinduism, and he took a course on Hindu philosophy. He aced the course, wrote, wrote a very fine paper comparing the Eastern idea of reincarnation with the Hebrew view of the afterlife. So now he knows more than one religion, which your grandmother did not. Do you really think he's begun to know Judaism better than she does? And I was on a roll, so I wouldn't let him say anything, and I kept going. And my grandmother, she came to these shores with her parents as a child from the Netherlands. They went through rough times in urban New Jersey. When she married, she gave birth to six children, one of whom died as a teenager when his appendix burst. The, the Dutch Reformed congregation they attended was her haven. She read the Bible and prayed every day. But the fact is, my grandmother could not utter one true sentence about any religion but her own. And as her grandson, I can write books on the subject of religious pluralism, but I simply refuse to. And he cut me off. He said, okay, okay, I get the point. You're right. I promise I'll never quote that line from Diana Eck again. And I'm glad he agreed, and I'm still convinced I'm right. But later I did think about it more. And I get back to him with a slightly revised assessment of what Diana Eck says. She's wrong to imply that our grandmothers were deficient in their religious knowing because they haven't taken the kinds of courses that she teaches at Harvard. But someplace in her comment, there is a truth that is lurking. Our knowledge of our own religious perspective can be enhanced by studying it in comparison to other religious perspectives. When I study Islam or Mormonism or Rabbinic Judaism or Buddhism, I'm not sure I increase my knowledge of God as such, certainly not in my worship. But I do get clearer about my evangelical theology by viewing it in comparison to other systems of thought. And I think all that kind of experience of uh, iron sharpening iron by being in dialogue and in engagement with people of other religious perspectives uh, actually helps me to, to be a stronger Christian. It's, it's good for my soul. And I want to suggest it could be good for your souls too. But, but how? That's the important question for this morning. 
And here's one important reason to take interfaith dialogue seriously. It keeps us from saying false things about other people. Fourteen years ago, I uh, uh, established with a leader, a leading theologian at Brigham Young University, a Mormon evangelical dialogue, about 10 Mormons, 10 evangelical scholars, including folks from uh, Wheaton College. And uh, we've been at this for 14 years, and I've learned a lot. I, I've learned, actually, that, that th things I thought I disagreed with with Mormonism, I don't really disagree with. And things that I thought I agreed with them on, I really do disagree with them on. But it's been a, a great learning experience. We had an amazing uh, time about seven years into the process when we went from talking together behind closed doors to a public event at the Mormon Tabernacle in uh, Salt Lake City. My friend Robert Millett uh, called me and he said, you know, Rabbi Zacharias is going to... Uh, be speaking at InterVarsity at uh, Utah, University of Utah, and I'd like to invite him to speak at Brigham Young University. Uh, but uh, Mormons probably know your name better than Ravi Zacharias because you've been around quite a bit uh, in, in, uh, in Mormon, the Mormon world. Uh, would you be willing to come and introduce him if I can get him to speak at Brigham Young? And I said, I'd be glad to. Well, he called me back a week later. And he said, you know, I cleared this with the uh, church officials in Salt Lake City, and they got back to us and said, why don't we just have a big meeting at the Mormon Tabernacle? And they want Robbie Zacharias, and he's agreed to do this. They want him to preach, to speak for one hour to a Mormon and an evangelical audience, and it turned out to be standing room only, uh, on the topic, what is the gospel? And the only restriction is he shouldn't trash Mormonism. He should just proclaim the gospel as he understands it from an evangelical point of view. And it really was a great evening. Robbie was terrific, but I caused them some problems because I introduced the evening standing at the podium at the Mormon Tabernacle. And I said, it's really great to be together. It's about time. Uh, we've uh, shouted at each other for 150 years, called each other's names, and, and just to gather together and to hear someone talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ, the saving work of Jesus Christ is a wonderful thing. And I said, I want to apologize to my Mormon friends here this evening because we've often sinned against you by telling you what you believe rather than asking you what you believe. Well, the next morning, the headline wasn't about Ravi Zacharias, but it hit the uh, wire services. Evangelical seminary president apologizes to Mormons, and uh, the hate mail still comes. Uh, who are you to speak on behalf of evangelicalism? Who are you to apologize to, to Mormons? But I haven't repented of that. And in fact, a few weeks after that, I saw a notice somewhere that there was going to be a talk in Los Angeles by a representative of the countercult movement about the evils of Mormonism. And so I went to hear it, and the guy actually said some good things, but he also said some things that were clueless about the way Mormons really think. He quoted the, what we call the Lorenzo Snow couplet, what, what man now is, God once was, what God now is, man may become, and that was the centerpiece about everything that was wrong for Mormonism, and the fact is that Mormonism has never endorsed that officially. It's a piece of what the Mormon theologians and leaders call folk Mormonism. And when Gordon Hinckley, who was the president of the Mormon Church, was asked by Time Magazine a couple of years before he died about that, he said, yeah, I used to hear about that quite a bit, but we don't really even talk about that much anymore. So, I mean, that's the status of that. So I went up to the speaker afterward, and I introduced myself, which was a big mistake. And, uh, and I said to him, you know, you said some good things tonight, and I learned some things, but uh, you're really wrong about a couple things, and you ought to look into it more carefully. He got very angry. And he said, you intellectuals, you're always trying to make these fine theological and sophisticated distinctions. We don't have time for that. We're in a battle for the truth, and we've got to win the battle. And the irony is that he seemed to be saying that it's okay to utter falsehoods in the cause of the truth. And the reality is that the God of the Scriptures tells us in one of the ten great commandments, 
that we should not bear false witness against our neighbors. And it's so important for us then to engage in dialogue with our neighbors, at least to understand things from their point of view. There are two rules for dialogue. There are about, some people have written Ten Commandments for dialogue and all the rest, but there are two that I find very helpful. And the one is, when you're engaging in dialogue with people from another faith tradition, don't put your best against their worst. I've experienced this in uh, wonderful dialogues with, uh, between evangelicals and Catholics, that uh, when you're arguing with, with, as, a, as, as an evangelical, and I know there are Catholics here, when, you're, when an evangelical is arguing with a Catholic, uh, you don't say that the Westminster Confession of Faith is better than village Catholicism in southern Italy. And furthermore, it's not very nice when Catholics tell us that uh, the philosophy of St. Thomas Aquinas is better than Pentecostal snake handling in, in rural Kentucky. If we're going to talk about their worst, we've got to talk about our worst. And if we're going to talk about their best, we've got to talk about our best. And it's very important that we keep things on that level. And another important rule is this, that we need to work at stating their views in ways that they themselves would state them to get inside of another perspective and make sure that we're, we're, we're saying things in ways that they would own, that they, they see as legitimate expressions of their faith, so that when we dialogue, we're, we're dialoguing on the basis of understanding the views as they understand them. And here's another big reason why it's good to engage in genuine attempt to understand another religious perspective, that it can even increase our knowledge of the truth. And that's so important for the careers that many, many of you folks are preparing for. Bob Lane is a graduate of Wheaton College who went on to serve for a number of years as the CEO of the John Deere uh, company. And he has often said in dialogues that I've had with him that one of the most important lessons that he learned at Wheaton College was taking a course from the great philosophy professor Arthur Holmes whose one, one of his fundamental uh, theses was uh, that undergirded a lot of his teaching, all truth is God's truth. And Bob Lane said that has made it possible for me as the CEO of, uh, of this global company, John Deere, to, uh, to work in helpful ways with Muslims and Hindus, Sikhs, people of no religion at all, because I don't have to assume automatically that they're wrong about everything, that uh, what motivates them is of the devil, but that I can know that all God's truth is, all, all truth is God's truth. John Calvin is a good case in point here for somebody who can help us. Even though the great reformer had established himself as a defender of the idea of the total depravity of humankind in his fallenness, he actually managed to express a lot of respect for pagan thinkers. John Calvin had studied law before he was, uh, uh, had his evangelical conversion, and he never lost respect for the ideas that he had gleaned from the writings of Seneca and Cicero and Aristotle, ancient Greek and Roman writers. And in his Institutes, John Calvin says this, that there is an admirable light of truth that is shining in the thoughts of pagan thinkers. And this means, he says, that the mind of man, though fallen and perverted from its wholeness, and I'm quoting here, can still be clothed and ornamented with God's excellent gifts. And then he went on to say that to refuse to accept the truth produced by pagan minds is to dishonor the Spirit of God. That's a very strong statement from a guy who believes in our total depravity. And we have to be very careful not to dishonor the Spirit of God, who is the Spirit of truth, who is working well beyond the boundaries of, of our own Christian communities. And that's why it's so important for us to be studying the intellectual contributions being made by unbelievers, non-believers, people of no religious perspective, or many other religious perspectives, because to refuse to explore them for the sake of finding out the truth is to, is to run the risk of grieving the Spirit of God. One of my favorite spiritual writers is, uh, I mentioned one yesterday, but Simone Weil, W-E-I-L, 
uh, a, a Jewish convert to uh, a Catholic faith. And she says this, Christ likes us to prefer the truth to him because before being Christ, he is the truth. And then this amazing statement, and if, if one turns aside from Christ to go toward the truth, one will not go very far before, before falling into the arms of Jesus. That is, we can step out into the unknown, uh, holding, uh, holding as tentative certain things that, that we firmly believe, uh, because since Christ is the truth, we're not going to get very far out there without falling into the arms of, of Jesus, who is the truth. And so we need to be open to, to surprises, people who surprise us in, in various ways, and to live with some mystery. The uh, Japanese-American theologian Kosuke Koyama once uh, gave a speech that I attended, and he said this, and it stuck with me, every Christian has to make a choice about God. Either you've got a generous God or you've got a stingy God. And that really is a choice that we have to make. And Arthur Holmes' great uh, proclamation, all truth is God's truth, is uh, pointing us to a, a generous God, a God who is working beyond the boundaries of our own Christian communities. And if we're going to experience the generosity of God, we need to be open to genuinely learning from people of other religious perspectives, but never, never falling into the trap of refusing to point people to Jesus. And that's the tension that we have to live. I live a lot with that tension between, between mystery and conviction. I gave up. I've, I've spoken several times at uh, Chautauqua in New York State, which is this great conference grounds. They have operas and they have uh, symphonies and they have all kinds of speakers. Uh, it was originated in the 19th century where people would go to hear lectures by folks like Mark Twain and Ralph Waldo Emerson. And uh, I've spoken there several times. And uh, a couple years ago, they had a, a, a series, a one-week series, where I spoke about the role of the Abrahamic religions in America. It sounds like a bad joke, but they had a, an imam, a, a, a rabbi, uh, uh, a Catholic priest, and, and me as an evangelical Christian. And uh, the imam went first, one, four days in a row. The imam went first, then the rabbi, then the priest, who happened to be the president of Notre Dame, and then uh, I was cleanup hitter, so I, I got a chance to summarize the, the whole week. And I talked a lot about the role of evangelical Christianity in American culture, some of the stupid mistakes that we've made, some of the ways in which we've embarrassed ourselves, but also some of the positive, very positive things about evangelicalism and uh, some of the signs of hope, which I think this, this auditorium here is full of signs of hope, of people who are willing to present a kinder, kinder and gentler evangelicalism that is firmly committed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I talked about all those things. Then I told them a, a story at the end about uh, the recent presidential prayer breakfast. My wife and I have gone to, uh, this is the first time this year that I haven't been we haven't been to the National Prayer Breakfast since uh, 1989. And so we've heard them all, Bono and Mother Teresa and other great speakers there. And when, uh, after the prayer, the, the, if you ever go to the National Prayer Breakfast, uh, there's not much prayer and there's not much breakfast. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but there's a, a leadership luncheon after the National Prayer Breakfast, and uh, often some of the better stuff happens there. And on this particular occasion, the speaker was uh, King Abdullah II from Jordan, a Muslim, and he was wonderful. He said, this is a time, given the, the violence in our world, given the, the conflict, this is such an important time for Jews of goodwill, Christians of goodwill, and Muslims of goodwill 
to work together to produce a, a quest for peace, for being good neighbors, uh, for condemning the, the violence of our, each of our fundamentalisms, our, the radicalisms within our own faith communities. And it was a wonderful affirmation. And about 30 of us had the opportunity right after that to spend an hour and a half with him in a, a closed-door session, and he was even better there. Uh, give and take, he, people ask questions, tough questions, and, and it was actually very illuminating and very inspiring. And there came a time when his bodyguards came in, and they were about to usher him away. And an elderly rabbi, I'm telling this story at Chautauqua now, an elderly rabbi said, Your Majesty, please, another, another minute, two more minutes, just tell them we need two more minutes with you. And, and the king waved his bodyguards away. And then this rabbi said, You know, we're, we're sitting around this table, Christians, Jews, and Muslims, we're all children of Abraham. And I've been so impressed with what you've had to say. And I want to make a promise that I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for your safety. We need your leadership. I'm going to pray for the safety of your family. And before you go, I know this is pretentious, the rabbi said, but on behalf of, of all of the children of Abraham here sitting around this table, I want to give you a blessing. And then he pronounced, he held his hand out toward the rabbi at the other end of the, uh, toward the, the king at the other end of the table, and he pronounced Aaron's benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace. When I told the Chautauqua audience, I'm going to tell you two things about me as an evangelical as I encountered that. And the first is this, that as I witness a son of Isaac giving a blessing to a son of Ishmael. I said, thank God. I, I believe with all my heart. I don't know how to explain it all theologically, but I believe with all my heart that when the God and Father of Jesus Christ looked down on that rabbi giving that blessing to a son of Ishmael, I believe God says, that's good. That's really good. That's the first thing. I said, I live with a lot of mystery about it. But secondly, I've got to tell you this. At every Super Bowl, there's always somebody behind the goalpost holding up a sign that says John 3.16. That could be me. And I've got to tell you this about myself. I live with a lot of mystery about what God is doing out there in the larger world, what God is doing, what the spirit of the living God is doing in other religions. But when it comes right down to it, i got to hold up my John 3.16 sign. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but will have everlasting life. And I told that to the Chautauqua audience. Afterward, a Jewish lady came up to me, a Jewish woman from New York City, and she said, uh, you know, I, I've heard this word evangelical. Uh, I've always thought it was a bad word. I mean, you know, people use it, and it just seemed like really bad people, mean people, she said, but I really like what you had to say today. She said, I'm going to make you a promise. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for your safety, she said. I'm going to pray for the safety of your family, you know. What I really wanted to say to her is, uh, don't just pray for me. But pray for a, a rising generation of evangelical students at places like Wheaton College who are willing to live with mystery, who are willing to follow the truth wherever the truth leads them because they know that they cannot go very far toward the truth without falling into the arms of Jesus. And at the same time, are willing to hold up the John 3.16 sign at Super Bowl games. May it be so uh, with you, and I will be praying for you. Thank you all, and God bless you.